I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled Millennials, E-Learning, and the Evolving Workplace. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available within 24 hours. If you registered through Extension's free events website, which most of you did, you will automatically receive an email tomorrow with a link to this recording. My name is Lisa Kotowaki and I'm a program manager here at UC Irvine Extension. This slide just has a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with an overview of WebEx features, so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information about UCI Extension's e-learning instructional design certificate program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins March 28th. I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Mary Keenan, Vice President of Product for Power Forward. And at the end of her presentation today, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send over any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a chat message over to UCI John and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Mary regarding the content of this presentation, please feel free to submit it in the chat panel and we will address it at the end if we have time. So for many of you, the chat panel may already appear on your screen. If you do not see it, you'll wanna find the chat bubble icon. Click on that icon and then the chat panel will show up. So again, feel free to submit any questions you may have throughout the webinar, and then we'll try to save a few minutes at the end to answer your questions. Here's a brief overview of the e-learning instructional design certificate program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to develop and deliver training online. Taught by industry experts, the program will help you become proficient in all aspects of e-learning, including the design and development of interactive lessons, project management, evaluation and assessment, and more. As a student in the program, you will get hands-on experience with our learning management system, take part in online learning community forums, receive individualized feedback from instructors, and have the opportunity to network and learn from others in the field. Our program is designed for a number of audiences, individuals who are completely new to e-learning instructional design, training managers and coordinators, HR professionals, and individuals who have taken on a training role within their department. If you currently deliver face-to-face instructor-led training, your company may be asking you to switch to e-learning as they recognize the value of training online. In order to be successful in our certificate program, students must be comfortable navigating software applications and learning management systems. The certificate program is composed of six required courses, which add up to 15 units total. To be eligible for the certificate, students must complete all six courses with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed declaration of candidacy form. Now, since there is a small candidacy fee, I typically advise students to take a few classes in our program first before they apply, just to make sure that they wanna complete the full certificate program. As I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of six online courses. The required courses are listed below. Principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools, designing and developing interactive e-learning courses, project management for e-learning professionals, e-learning evaluation and assessment, and the e-learning instructional design pra practicum. Each course is 2.5 units and will run for eight weeks online. We highly recommend that students start off with the principles course and follow the recommended sequence of courses as shown on this slide. The curriculum has been developed to flow from one course to the next, so taking the courses in this sequence is beneficial. Please note that you, the practicum course does have a prerequisite. You must have successfully completed all of the other required courses prior to enrolling in the practicum. In the upcoming spring 2016 quarter, we are offering principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools, designing and developing interactive e-learning courses, and the e-learning evaluation and assessment course. 
Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $615. Enrollment for spring is currently open, and students may enroll either online or over the phone by calling our Student Services Office at the number provided. We do encourage students to enroll early as classes fill up quickly. Each course in our program costs $615, so you're looking at a total of $3,690 in course fees for the six online classes. You don't pay the, t the entire total up front. You would simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. There is also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program. So in the end, you're looking at $3,815 for the entire certificate program. Please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Um, we do post our textbook information on the enrollment page, so you'll know if any course materials are required before you enroll in a class. Prior to enrollment in the practicum, students must also purchase or otherwise have access to and gain working knowledge of an authoring tool such as Articulate Studio, Storyline, Adobe Captivate, or an other authoring tool. Um, so therefore, software may be an additional expense, so you do want to keep that in mind when looking at the course fees. Please note that effective fall 2016, the course fee will be $625 per course. Here's a screenshot of the certificate page on our website. There is a lot of information about program requirements and course offerings on this page, so I do encourage you to visit it. And I wanted to point out here, I circled it in red on the slide, um, a special discount that we provide. We offer 10% off course fees to members of ATD San Diego and ATD Orange County chapters. So if you're a member of either one of these chapters, please visit your chapter website for more information on how to obtain the discount. And then on this slide here, you'll see a screenshot of our online course schedule, which always has the most up-to-date information. You can enroll in any available courses by clicking the green online button. And like I had mentioned before, right now we're taking enrollments for our spring quarter. If you see to be scheduled, that indicates when particular courses are scheduled to be offered, but registration just hasn't opened up yet. Now, as you can see, we don't offer every course every quarter, so you do want to plan accordingly. All right, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Mary, our guest presenter. So let me go ahead and hand the presenter ball over to her so that she can further introduce herself and begin her portion of the presentation. Mary, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, Lisa. Wonderful, take it away, thank you. Thank you, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start uh, by just giving you a little bit of a background about me. I've, I've got 20 years uh, training and development experience focused um, just about my entire career on e-learning, and I uh, my background is uh, very, uh, I've been in corporate K-12 workplace development environment, so it's a very cross-industry type experience in, in training and development. But I'd say probably where I focus the most is on startups and uh, fast-growing companies. I'm a bit of a startup junkie is kind of how I refer to myself. Um, and my latest company uh, that I'm working for is called Power Forward. Uh, we're focused on developing emerging leaders, and uh, uh, in that way, what we're doing is building skills and values-based decision-making. And so a lot of the presentation today is going to be focused sort of around the audience that we're addressing in, um, in fast-growing companies, which tends to be more millennial-focused, which is why we have that focus today in our presentation. And, um, you know, the, the, I guess the bottom line is that I thrive at the apex of technology and learning, and so Power Forward is just a continuation of that. But what we're talking about today is really uh, founded um, or grounded, I should say, in what we're experiencing right now, which is a generational shift. Um, I don't know if you've noticed a lot of news on millennials lately, but um, we're about due because uh, there's about 25 years between generations, and all of them reflected here. We've got 
on the far left, the greatest generation. Uh, the, the sort of general labels for these are that they are more traditionalist. Uh, you've got uh, your greatest generation hugging the millennial who's also experienced, experienced a lot of rapid change in their lifetime. Your Gen Xers, negative or otherwise, are considered kind of the skeptics of all the generations. And then you've got your baby boomers, which have experienced a lot of social change, and that's impacted their sort of mental models or their views. So, you know, every 25 years we kind of experience this, this round of what's going on with this new generation and how do they fit in and um, what is, you know, what does this mean for us? Because there is actually a shift going on. And what it means is it's time to just step back to reflect on that impact and, and what that means for us moving forward. So in 2015, um, we experienced a very big year. It, it marked the year that the millennial became not only the largest generation in the workforce, but the largest living generation. They surpassed the baby boomers. Uh, this shift has spurred a release of lots of official reports on the differences in workplace habits, technology use, and buying power of what appears to be a very hands-on, connected, collaborative, and values-focused population. Along with those great positive labels come some not so nice ones. Everything from self-absorbed and lazy to greedy to, um, you know, again, and then shifting to the other side, positive, innovative, social-minded, very generous, very focused on the environment. Uh, so just labels, labels, and labels. But what's really, I think, more important to focus on is that simultaneously we're watching the, the equally large population of baby boomers retire from business and leadership roles. So what's, this has really sort of left us with a looming leadership gap in the workplace. And what's uh, resulted is that we have young leaders being thrust into managerial roles with little to no preparation. Um, and then current approaches to leadership training are not necessarily a fit, but um, the lack of innovative options seem to keep us stuck, kind of force-fitting some of the traditional solutions that we have been using in the workplace rather than evolving our approach to a changing style of work. So what are we really talking about here? Um, a leadership gap is now officially considered looming as a massive exit of retiring older workers is leaving open positions. Um, younger leaders are being transitioned into these new roles with greater responsibility. According to uh, the Association for Talent Development, ATD, a staggering 49% of young leaders have moved into leadership positions before they're ready. 50% of millennials are already in leadership roles within their organization. 90% of all millennials who are managers took their role in the last five years. And globally, the most common age range for millennial managers to say they started managing is between 25 and 29 years of age. And, you know, at our company, we actually have spent a tremendous amount of time. We're at an early stage. It is a startup. We're at an early stage in our development right now. And what we've been doing is just heads down, spending a ton of time talking to our audience. And um, what I'd like to do is just kind of share with you what folks are saying to us. So what are the millennials, what are these leaders saying about it? Um, I was unsure of what I was doing. And these are kind of, these are common themes that we've been capturing. Unsure of what I was doing. I became a supervisor to my peers. I was promoted very quickly. I was left to figure things out alone. This is like a crash course MBA. Some very heavy things to be taking on as a new leader, um, especially with, um, you know, in, in the case of the companies that we're working with, these really sort of smaller, less established, fast-growing companies that are churning and needing people to just move up quickly in the organization. So I guess the question is, are we, um, you know, how do we address this? And are we missing the mark? I think um, I'd like to suggest that maybe we are a little bit. The you know, the technological innovation that's occurred over the past 40 years has been so dramatic that it's naturally shaped working individuals' expectations for creativity and innovation at work. I mean, in the last 15 years alone, we've watched the birth of an endless list of tools that keep us connected, tools that we rely on daily, Google, Facebook, smartphones, tablets, only being a handful. So not surprisingly, um, 
most employees desire access to career development wherever they are. They expect content, contacts, and courses offered at work through digital and online course offerings, collaboration, and video. This is how we live today, in much the same way they consume personalized entertainment content at home. Uh, the, the challenge, though, is that um, we're not really doing that. 70%, fully 70% of training hours are still taking place in an instructor-led classroom. That's as of 2014. So, you know, some forward-thinking businesses have figured out that keeping pace with the need for innovation can be accomplished by adjusting their culture and people development efforts to meet the needs of the workforce. Some are obvious, your Googles, your Facebooks, your Pinterest, where customized uh, learning experiences are more readily available through mentoring, they have targeted support. Other companies, they try to fill the gaps in their own training and development efforts by investing in expensive third-party leadership development gurus, the off-the-shelf stuff. But, you know, ultimately, the financial resources that it takes to offer this level of engagement, it relegates the majority of companies to what I, I refer to as the have-nots of people development. Established companies, they spend 34% more on training and development, which contributes to a dramatic difference in financial performance. It's actually a profit growth three times that of their competition. These companies are creative, they're often short on resources. Some of you are probably working for them. I know I certainly have, but um, you know, we work hard to make development a priority. We offer some sort of in-house development manager and intake training. But you know, without having the resources and time necessarily for structured development, there's a lot of scrambling for solutions. I've done this myself a lot. <laughs> Often choosing, you go off this generic off-the-shelf offerings to address some of the skill gaps of a broader audience, your Skillsoft, your, um, you know, um, Grovos, those types of platforms that things are sort of offered to you, and you piece things together and um, try to make it happen. Um, but despite some of these efforts, the numbers on individualized learning experiences and the type of learning that leaders are craving still come back looking fairly bleak. Um, so what's the gap? 56% of uh, ATD survey respondents believe that the current generation requires specialized leadership development. 66% agree that they require specialized leadership development, 66% of those leaders. Um, but only 15% report that their companies are currently offering these types of programs. So what are the leaders saying? The company isn't large enough to provide formal training for my role. We have access to technical courses online, but nothing related to performing my job. We have an annual team training. I had a one to two day manager training. There's a senior leadership seminar that, tri that trickles down. That trickling down, the, the sort of random spotty um, training offered here and there wherever we can get it is very, very typical for this type of an organization. So I guess what I'd like to suggest is that maybe we need to go back to basics a little bit. Let's ask them what they want. In order to build some leadership skills in an environment of high turnover, rapid growth, and seemingly mismatch working styles, the best approach might be just to pause and look at what we know. Let's talk to them. So here's what we heard. We want mentors, we want coaches, we want opportunities to apply knowledge. Let's get some advice from our peers. Can we reflect on some of the learning outside of the context of work? Can we learn from real examples? We heard more. I'd like one-on-one -on -one sessions. I'd like learning from people outside of my department, outside of my company. Show me once and let me roll with it. Give me some honest feedback. I want some learning as a team. 
I'd like to process, I'd like to research, I'd like to interview people. When we listen, nothing about their answers felt very surprising, which led us to ask, is it possible that the needs of these learners aren't so new or different? Reports, statistics, labels, analysis aside, what a typical young leader is asking for and what they should be looking for as an adult learner are very much aligned. Malcolm Knowles is the father of adult learning theory. According to him, an adult has an independent self-concept and can direct his or her own learning. They have an accumulated reservoir of life experiences to aid learning. They're ready to learn when they assume new social or life roles. They're problem-centered. They want to apply new learning immediately. They're motivated to learn by internal rather than external factors. As far as what works, Rather than taking wild guesses, maybe we should just focus on proven instructional methods for, de for delivering the message. Look at learner needs, then connect the dots using solid instructional design. So let's talk about some of the recommendations for instructional methods that meet the needs of these emerging leaders. Individualized. Don't stereotype them. Their interests and priorities are eclectic and fragmented despite being better connected. They have a natural interest in customization and individuality, so relate to them in this manner. Specific takeaways for that, well, let's look at content, let's look at the pace of our learning, and let's look at the technology that we're using to deliver it. What about accessibility? Um, in the mid-60s, um, Keller, who's a behaviorist and a pioneer in experimental uh, psychology, he created a plan for personalized learning known today as individualized instruction. A fundamental underpinning, underpinning for modern e-learning approaches individualized instruction defines a method of teaching that structures content, instructional design, technology, and pace of learning around the needs of the student. Individualized instruction is a particularly interesting approach to look at when thinking about leadership development. Just as emerging leaders are very individual in their approach to work and responsibility, they're individual in the way that they develop skills as leaders because there are no set rules for leadership. While business tends to define leadership through titles, the workplace is starting to move to a more personal view of leadership. Next up, experiential. In an ideal world, they would like to see their boss as a coach who supports them in their personal development, but also generally prefer to learn by doing rather than being told what to do. So what's the obvious here? Case studies. Use case studies, present emerging leaders with real events, and encourage them to discuss and interpret their solutions. You want to push them to make real-world decisions, and then ask them to justify the decisions that they made to help build confidence. Case studies prepare leaders to transfer knowledge to new but similar experiences. It creates an environment where decisions can be made in a safe environment, and it ties in personal reflection to solidify the experience to make it relevant and directly applicable. In our company, what we do is we use um, case studies as the basis for, for our instruction. Um, we apply uh, reflection, opportunities for reflection. We offer the ability for learners to um, view each other's responses to uh, dilemmas within the case studies. So we provide this all of this online and we offer choices, A or B, and why would you do that? The why would you do that is open for all users to see so people can compare their responses to each other because there's a ton of learning that comes from the case method in sharing your why and sharing why you did it. Um, we also offer offline uh, discussion materials for folks to be, um, to take advantage of to then bring that discussion or that, that individual experience to a group conversation within the company, extending the learning even further. So the case method is a really good one to look to. Uh, by reflecting um, on the detailed experiences of leaders, there's an opportunity to connect with different parts of people's stories. And individual's biases and backgrounds create a filter when listening to an experience that can result in different takeaways. Narrative case studies accompanied by questions that promote discussion allow for access to the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy of cognitive learning, where knowledge can be applied to new situations. 
Case studies in this format allow the individual to move beyond the recall of knowledge to, uh, to analysis, evaluation, and application at higher levels to apply that learning. They want, they want a supportive environment. They want to make individual contributions. They want to be connected, and they want to be woven into a larger discussion. Their social networks and circle of friends gatekeep, and their crowdsource impact is powerful. I think we've all witnessed that. Overwhelmingly, media attention on this generation focuses on the fact that they are the technology generation. But behind the obvious tide of technology is a deeper purpose. They're networkers, they're relationship builders, they live and work collaboratively, and technology is simply the tool for achieving this. They might be onto something. When we look at social learning theories, uh, particularly Vygotsky's work in cognitive development, we see that the skills developed through peer uh, collaboration or mentoring far exceeds what can be done alone. Uh, according to Bandura's social learning theory, learning would be exceedingly laborious, not to mention hazardous, if people had to rely solely on the effects of their own actions to inform them uh, what to do. Fortunately, most human behavior is learned observationally through modeling, from observing others. One forms an idea of how new behaviors are performed. A more modern take on it comes from uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business. And Professor Charles, Charles, Charles O'Reilly points out that leadership research is often focused on the individual. But when working in an organization, we learn that the real success is actually a team effort. So support the natural tendency to learn through collaboration by creating an environment that is informal and formal mentoring opportunities and is full of opportunities to reason things out and challenge peers. For six and 10 millennials, a sense of purpose is part of the reason they chose to work for their current employers. This sense of purpose starts with a connection between an employee and employer's values. Setting clear organizational and team values is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Rather than simply having values that employees are expected to learn, organizations should give employees the opportunity to explore their own values as they grow into leaders and tie their personal and organizational value system to on-the-job decision-making. Specifically, a focus on values-based decision-making, and this is my take on it, this is the organization we're working with and this is what we'd like to focus on, where the decision maker considers not only, out, not only the outcome, but also the consequence of their decision in the context of a value across all levels of an organization helps an organization align its values with its actions. It helps us to walk the walk, and that's what, that's what folks are looking for now. They want to find meaning in what they're doing. We can probably see some of that a little bit with what's happening in politics these days. Um, additionally, it empowers emerging leaders to serve as the key decision makers while living not just knowing their core values. So basically, I'm not sure that they're so different after all, that a lot of the labels seem to imply that they are. But, um, you know, we really need to look at the way that we develop these incoming leaders. Um, the progress of technology over the past 15 years has impacted how people communicate and learn. And logically, we should consider that when working towards solutions to address the current challenges we face in leadership development. But, you know, rather than trying to come up with new ways to address the issue, it makes more sense to go back to the basics. Emerging leaders know what they need, and they know how they need it. They're looking for an individualized, experiential, supportive, and purpose-focused environment that allows them to grow into their new roles. If you revisit adult learning theory and cognitive development principles, their needs are really just right on track. 
and all of the proven instructional methods that we use to support these needs can really help to form the foundation of a truly effective uh, leadership development program. Now, I know that we've got a lot of people on the line, and we've sort of said let's hold off for questions, but I'd like to invite anybody who has anything to ask or contribute to go ahead and fire away. Thank you, Mary. And for those of you who are logged in, um, again, please use the chat panel to submit your questions. You'll want to make sure that you send it to all panelists. That way, um, both Mary and myself will be able to see your question come in. So, Mary, I'll give you just a few minutes to scroll through um, your chat panel to see if any questions have come in um, to you directly, and I'll also be looking to see if I can um, address any that may have come in to me. You know, I actually would like to ask if anybody um, in the audience has um, what what sort of companies are we working for? Are you looking are you looking at uh, are you coming from corporate environments? Are you working for smaller, fast growing companies? I know that you've done your survey, Lisa. I don't know if that comes from there or if anybody can um, kind of let me know if you're coming from a, a fast growing company and if so, kind of does this connect with you? And again, please submit your responses in the chat panel. Mary, I got one question. Um, what role do you see instructional designers playing in addressing this leadership or training gap, um, especially in, in ID's role, maybe working with management at the strategic level? Mm, yeah, that's a good question because it kind of depends on where you um, – where you come from and how your organizational structure works. But I think I, I think an ID's role is to to do your job. I mean, it, it, part of that is getting to know your audience, getting to know working with HR or with uh, the training folks who are, um, or your people, your head of people, whoever is, is, you know, has kind of a profile of the company and getting to know who your audience is, not just their job roles, not just their functions and the skills and behaviors that you want them to walk away with, but who they are and where they come from. Um, you know, we don't, we don't try to ad address age much at, in the workplace, but at the same time, there are influencing factors on kind of how to deliver to them. And that is very specifically in, in the, um, you know, the onus of the instructional designer to think about uh, appropriate delivery methods. And I would say that, especially now when, when sort of the topic is so hot and you're seeing these trends happen, you know, bringing attention to the fact that there is a, you know, high predominance of, of millennials taking on these leadership roles, the shift is happening and we need, just need to be kind of keeping pace with what is going to uh, hit home with people and what's going to help them internalize and, and, and connect with that experience. I'd love to hear, I just uh, saw Dan, uh, Damaris, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, you saying you work in a large company. Curious to know if, um, you know, at your company, is there any um, discussion about or um, concern for how training delivery is happening right now? And Mary, while we wait for that, for um, that attendee to respond. In, in your experience, are there certain elements that you have seen present in successful training programs as far as delivery methods, um, how much of the training is delivered maybe in an asynchronous versus synchronous or, you know, face-to-face -face versus online? Are there any elements that kind of run across all of the successful training programs that you've seen that have been developed and delivered? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, first of all, I'm, you know, just because ID is my background and this is where I come from and this is what we should all be speaking right now, is just, you know, the, the content needs to match, the delivery method needs to match the content. The content should lead, first of all, in deciding how you're delivering anything. But um, I think where it gets a little bit fuzzy is, you know, if, if someone is not going to pay attention to the way that you're delivering content because it's not convenient for them, then you're sort of up a creek. So I'd say the most successful programs that I've um, worked with or seen implemented really are a combination. You know, blended learning is obviously a very, you know, popular approach, increasingly so, and it should be. But a lot of that is because, um, you know, the, the pendulum has, you know, swung from 
you know, in, you know, face-to-face -face training to online and then back to blended a little bit. But it just, um, you know, it, you have to look at what your audience needs, and that's, that's basic for instructional design, and um, whether it's, it's um, you know, the, taking a look and then, and then taking in a little bit of the, the sort of the human performance aspect too. What are you, uh, what do you expect them to walk away knowing or doing? And um, are there any gaps and are there any tools or resources that are missing in the environment for them to be able to um, kind of do their job effectively? Um, a lot of that is just, hands down, get, you know, getting dirty and talking to people and finding out and understanding what their job involves and what's missing for them, not making assumptions about it. So I guess short, long answer to your short question, but it, it really just takes, um, takes getting to know your audience, getting to know their um, environment and, and talking to them a lot to understand what it is that they're going to need and, and what they're going to walk away using. Great. Thank you. I'd be curious to know if anybody has any questions about um, this slide, the sense of purpose and the values. I, I, you know, it comes out a lot in some of the labels that we see, um, that labels that are sort of assigned to millennials is that they have this sort of higher sense of purpose. They're more concerned about the environment. Percentages of donations to nonprofit organizations are higher, you know, than your typical Gen X or Boomer, and, um, you know, I don't, what I don't see is a lot of this being incorporated into, into training development, um, mainly because it feels like it's so individualized, but, um, you know, there's a lot of organizations that take values and values, you know, they have their own values and they apply values and they want um, employees to um, own those values and, and think about those values and consider those business values as corporate values as they're doing their jobs, but there's a huge disconnect between people who are, um, you know, between the values that they're using and their individual values. So I'd be curious to know if anybody out there has even kind of approached this at all in their organizations or if this is something that um, we're kind of crazy in doing ourselves. <laughs> and then it looks like we did get a response back from the attendee. Um, looks like his company, his or her company, is trying to have more technology built into trainings, um, both interactive and so forth. I know it's impossible to talk to a large group of people like this, but um, consider this consider this something to to work on. All right, employee resource groups. Oh, that's great. Good. I'm 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 encouraged to see that. And um, I guess my only other question would be, does anybody find that the, um, that they're experiencing a specific shift in their workplace or is it, is it, is it feeling kind of high level right now or do you, do you see the shift happening in your workplace? And going off of that, maybe how many of you logged in here today are playing a role, um, whether it be as an instructional designer or we may have individuals logged in from other positions, but what role are you playing in kind of shaping some of the training and development programs in your workplace? All right, we got a comment. A sense of purpose is useful to any agency or employer for any age employee. And then another attendee says, it's slowly happening at our site. So it looks like some companies are, are rolling out different initiatives. 
And actually, you know, Carissa, you say that, and that is so true. And, and please don't take this presentation to mean that it doesn't apply to other employees. I think what, um, if anything, is, is happening is that because of these, um, you know, I guess there's upsides and downsides to having millennial labels or generational labels. Um, the downside being obviously that you can start to um, categorize people and um, stereotype people. The upside being that there might be some things that um, come up uh, like this, this sort of sense of value and purpose that is, is coming up and that we haven't traditionally sort of dealt with on an individual level in the workplace, but you know what? If it's something that um, folks are looking for and striving for, that's going to better, you know, the environment for all of us. So um, definitely, I absolutely agree with you on that. Does anybody have any questions for me about um, our organization, about the work that we're doing, about um, some of the things that I've talked about today and how it's being implemented? Describing our method of involving IDs. Okay, I think that is a good question. So right now, um, the process has been, we're actually a very small organization. We're just starting out, and um, what we're doing is, um, maybe I should just describe the process itself of instructional design, and so what we're doing is um, we're combining what we're doing um, sort of traditionally in instructional in, in the process with an agile development um, process for building the application. So it's kind of part and parcel. Um, and if anybody works in technology companies, you kind of know that that um, agile process is really critical to getting a uh, project or a product out the door efficiently and quickly without having to do a ton of re a rework. Traditionally, in a waterfall method of development, you would um, build the entire product put it in front of users, get feedback on it, and have to rebuild the entire product again. Um, right now, um, with Agile, what you do is you build and you test, and you build and you test, and you build and you test. And so, as far as instructional design goes, it's, it's, it's integrated with that process. And so, we have concurrently, while we are building the platform, we are actually um, working on content development. And so, we're um, taking, um, you know, taking some of the user uh, interviews and um, usability type process and leveraging on that to then build the content. We test the content and then that then informs back um, into the uh, product process, the product, the software development process informs that and the next stages. And so it's sort of piggybacking one on the other as we, as we build. Any challenges or roadblocks that you've your companies run into that may be useful for others to hear? Mm. I think one of them is um, distinguishing between um, the product and the content. Um, and one of the, the ways that we got around that is by um, actually creating the content independently, testing it on um, uh, really simply, low, very low fi, low, low fi as they say, or low fidelity. We just literally built case studies using um, Google Forms, and we're bringing those case studies to individuals to go through. And you know, with a with a, um, a an explanation that we wanted to isolate this content. We want you to take a look at it totally separately from the platform because a lot of times the bells and whistles of a cool looking platform can color somebody's view of what the content is. Um, so I don't know if that's a challenge as much as it was. Um, it was a challenge in the beginning to try to to try to say, okay, well, as we're sort of concurrently building these things, we want to test them. How do we separate it out? Um, you can also do paper-based tests and and um, you know sit down with people and just have them go through it. But we wanted them to have that experience of kind of going through an, a quote-unquote e-learning type of module. So um, Google Forms became our best friend to get through that. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for presenting today on this topic. Um, I hope all of you logged in today, gained some insight into training millennials, and thank you again, Mary, for sharing your experiences with us um, and some of the, the learning points that attendees can take with them about your experience um, with your company Power Forward as well. If any of you have any questions or if you think of a question, again, we will be sending out a recording link to the webinar uh, tomorrow, so you should be receiving that automatically. But if you think of a question after watching the recording or later on um, today, please feel free to send an email. I've listed my email address on this slide. Let me go back to the first slide so that you can um, jot down Mary's email address as well. Here we go. This has Mary's, oh, there's a comma. There's no comma at the end of Power Forward. It's just Mary at gopowerforward.com. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them um, to Mary directly, or you can feel free to send them on to me as well, and I can forward them on to Mary. Thank you again, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks so much, Mary. Thanks, Lisa. Take care. Bye. Bye.